Until now, all games I've covered are largely playable without knowledge of the Japanese language. That might sound absurd, but let me explain. If I gave you a translation guide to any of the first 12 games released on the Wonderswan, you might not be able to tell me the story of all the games, but you would be able to play the game mechanically just fine. This isn't the case for Go Raku o Tango, because Tango is Japanese for words, and that is precisely what this game is about. Go Raku o Tango is a Japanese word game, so if you don't know the Japanese language, or at the very least its alphabets, you aren't going to get very far. But Go Raku o Tango has way too interesting of a history for a game that was completely forgotten over time. In April of 1996, Panasonic decided to open a subsidiary that would take over developing the successor to the 3DO system, 3DO M2, from the 3DO company. If you're a younger viewer, 3DO was a video game system available in the early to mid 90s that featured cutting edge technologies, but failed to get traction due to its high price and tough competition. That subsidiary was Panasonic Wondertainment and would also have a game development department responsible for some of the system's launch titles. Unfortunately, in June of 1997, due to the commercial failure of the original 3DO, plans to release the 3DO M2 were aborted, and all of Panasonic Wondertainment's titles in development none of which were ever publicly announced, were scrapped. Now that their target platform was yanked from under them, Panasonic Wondertainment pivoted towards more hopeful systems. They started working on two titles, Web Mystery Yochimu Omiru Neko, an FMV murder mystery game for the Dreamcast, and Goraku o Tango for the Wonderswan. But just a month before the game's scheduled release dates, Panasonic announced that they were exiting the game business altogether, and the subsidiary was shut down. They passed along both games to a developer called Mebius, would finish and publish both games. Now this is where the history becomes a little fuzzy. I spent hours trying to find whatever I could about Mebius and found nothing substantial. But here's what I can say. Mebius was a Yugen Gaisha, or a limited company. The only games I can find any trace of being released by them are the two aforementioned games, released in April of 1999. But in 2005, the Japanese government announced that they would abolish Yugen Gaisha, replacing them with Goldo Gaisha, modeled around American LLCs. However, Pre-existing Yugen Gaisha all became Kabushiki Gaisha, or joint stock companies. So why again am I saying all of this? Well, coincidentally, a Kabushiki Gaisha named Mebius incorporated in April of 2005. This is the company more recently responsible for developing the 3DS version of the Steel Empire alongside Hot B, and the publisher of the PS4 version of Unholy Heights. Unfortunately, their website's game release history only goes back to 2010. I have no proof that these two companies are related, and my understanding of the company's act is too limited to tell if there are any signs of a relation hiding in the 2005 company's profile. The large gap in information between 1999 and 2000 is really what makes me hesitant to offer any conclusion of my own, but I suppose there is a possibility that these two companies are related. If anybody has any information on the Mebius that went missing after 1999, please let me know, because I'd love to hear about it. But what makes this even weirder is that Mebius isn't even credited for the Game Boy Color port, released a year later by a slightly less mysterious company called J-Wing. J-Wing was a prolific developer of poorly received Game Boy titles, up until their mysterious disappearance sometime following the release of their final game for the Game Boy Advance in 2003. I suppose I should also point out that this game turns the table on established swan song tropes. Yes, this is the first game on the Wonder Swan to be ported to the Game Boy instead of from the Game Boy but given the circumstances around the game's release, it almost feels like a boring footnote. I guess now that I've explained the game's peculiar history, I should get around to talking about the game itself. The game is pretty simple. You're given a map of seven locations around the world. Selecting one takes you to a stage with a specific theme appearing at the top of the screen. Under it is an image, obscured by square tiles containing one character from either hiragana or katakana alphabet. It's your job to rearrange all of the tiles into words that fit the theme in order to make the tiles disappear and reveal the underlying image. It's sort of an intersection between crosswords and 15 tile puzzles, testing your knowledge of Japanese vocabulary in various categories. There lies the main issue with the game coming from a non-native speaker perspective. If you've been learning Japanese for recreational purposes, it's likely that you've prioritized the vocabulary relevant to your interests over acquiring as many words as possible regardless of the domain. So when the game throws a theme at you that you're utterly unprepared for, the game's difficulty spikes up randomly and it becomes frustrating. But it's hard to fault the game for that, as we were never intended to play this game in the first place. History aside, there's nothing remarkable about this game, and I think that's why it has become so forgotten. All Wonderswan games so far share the same price, and there's really no reason you would blow 3800 yen on a collection of word puzzles like this when you could get something of much greater value. And in today's world, this is the kind of simple puzzle you'd expect to get for free daily in a smartphone app, so it seems even more ridiculous in retrospect. 